بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, So إن شاء الله this will be the uh, last sira for uh, two weeks or maybe three weeks we'll see uh, and uh, we're going to finish off by talking about the major incidents that occurred before the battle of Uhud and uh, today is a very controversial topic uh, so pay attention and take good notes. Before we get to the controversial topic, let's begin with some of the more smaller incidents. Uh, so between the Battle of Badr and Uhud, a number of small expeditions took place. And they are not uh, very important in the large scale of things, but each one of them had its own, if you like, uh, uh, reasons and issues and benefits for it. And the first of these issues uh, the first of these incidents, it is called, it's a, it's a very difficult title, Qarqaratul Qudr. Qarqaratul Qudr. After the place where it took place, it was called Qarqaratul Qudr. And what happened was that some of the neighboring uh, Mushrikeen tribes of Medina, they wanted to take revenge on the Muslims because their business had been cut off. What business? What business would have been cut off? The caravans. You know, uh, to this day, when an interstate goes through, small cities clamor to the senators and congressmen to have the interstate go through that city. Why? Because business. That's the main business, right? Cops, how do they get their money? You know, these small, these small cities, how does the money come in? It's basically those tickets and then the convenience stores. So, when the caravan of the Quraysh had to basically divert its route, so some of the smaller tribes that used to get their income from buying and selling with the caravan, so they wanted to basically poke the Muslims to make sure they don't do it again. And so uh, they, uh, only seven days after the Battle of Badr, uh, the, the tribes of the Banu Salim and Ghatafan, now the Banu Salim and Ghatafan are very large tribes, so these are small subsections of those tribes that happen to be living around Medina. The Ghatafan is one of the largest tribes of Arabia. Uh, and the Ghatafan will play a role in the battle of the Khandaq in particular. But this is some of the sections of the Ghatafan. Some of the sections of the Banu Salim, they attached a small, uh, they, they detached, sorry, a small uh, skirmish, a small entourage of 200 people to attack Medina. And so when the Prophet ﷺ heard this, he launched an offensive against them and uh, when they saw the 200 people, uh, sorry, when the Muslims saw the army up front, they turned their backs and fled. The Quraysh, not the Quraysh, the pagans turned their backs and fled when they saw the Muslims coming. Even though quantity-wise they were more than the Muslims. But when they saw the Muslims coming, they fled and they left all of their tents and their booty and their belongings, they left it over there. And so the Muslims basically acquired most of their animals. And this was a huge uh, surplus for them, so much so it is said that every Muslim who participated, he got two camels. And that's basically a nice amount of money. Every single Muslim, he got uh, two camels. And it was also in this battle that uh, the Prophet ﷺ, so what happened was, and again, as you realize, in every single class that I do, we don't go into a lot of detail, because otherwise we'd stay here forever. But what happened was, when the Prophet ﷺ reached their vicinity, the first person they found was a slave, an Abyssinian slave. And his name was Yasar. His name was Yasar. So they captured him and then they f the, the non-Muslims fled. So Yasar was left with the Muslims. And he saw the Muslims and he converted to Islam. When he's with them for a while, he sees how good they are, he converts to Islam. And so uh, the Sahabi who captured him, he said, O Messenger of Allah, he is yours. Because he's a Muslim now, he's a good Muslim, he is yours. And the Prophet he never kept a slave as you know. He never kept any male slave. Whenever slave that he got, he uh, freed that slave. And so he freed Yasar. But Yasar remained with him as a servant. Uh, and so Yasar became one of the, the servants of the Prophet uh, wasallam. And as usual, it was a sunnah of the Prophet that when he had any battle, he would camp there for how many days? Three days. This was his sunnah that established from Badr. So he camped over there. And in uh, explaining why they fled, he, he told the Sahaba, and this hadith is in Bukhari, نُصِرْتُ بِالرُّعْبِ مَصِيرَةَ شَهْرٍ That I have been helped by Allah, that my enemies are terrified of me, even if I'm at a month's journey away. نُصِرْتُ بِالرُّعْبِ This is one of the uh, ways that Allah helped the Prophet wasallam. that just by seeing and hearing of the Muslims, they would flee and run away. And so he explained to them why this happened. So this is called the, the expedition of Qarqaratul Qadr. Uh, the second expedition, which is uh, interesting in its own way, it is called the Battle of Sawiq. The Battle of Sawiq. And this occurred 
around two or three months after Badr. Uh, probably in the early part of Dhul Hijjah, of the second year of the Hijrah. And the reason for this battle is a little bit, um, a little bit disgusting, to be honest. And that is that Abu Sufyan had made a promise, a vow, a nadr to Allah, that he would not take a bath until he avenged Badr. So how long is the guy going to wait? <laughs> okay. He would not take a bath, even from Janaba. And this shows us, by the way, that taking a bath from Janaba was in their custom. And of course, this must have come from Ibrahim salam, right? So he remained in that state, unbelievably, without touching water for months. And I guess finally, he really had to do something, right? And so uh, he gathered together uh, probably around 150, 250. Again, we don't have an exact quantity, but probably around 200, similar as the previous battle. Gathered together 200 of the Quraysh, and he launched an offensive. And the Banu Nadir, which was the second Yahudi tribe, the Banu Nadir gave him protection. And they gave him food and supplies and water. So we're going to come back to the Banu Nadir later on. But this is now blatant treachery because the, the, one, of the, one, of the treaty, one of the conditions of the treaty is you will not help the Quraysh against us. And one of the conditions, if we are externally attacked, the two of us will act as one. Right? So the Banu Nadir actually gave supplies and food and water uh, to the, the small entourage of Abu Sufyan and they hosted him to reinvigorate, reinvigorate and reinforce him before he attacked Medina and then Abu Sufyan uh, with a smaller group, not 200, maybe 20 or so, he launched an offensive into one of the date gardens of Medina and complete surprise upon the people there. He frightened the women and children. He killed uh, two of the Ansar. He burnt down the garden and uh, when the commotion began to spread, so this is blatant if you like plagiarism or not, terrorism or whatnot. Uh, and so when the commotion spreads, the Muslims say Abu Sufyan is here, the, 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 the Quraysh are here. So the, a small force gathers and they start attacking the caravan that Abu, not the caravan, the, the, the army that Abu Sufyan has come with. And in their rush to once again flee, once again, just like what happened in Qarqarat al Qadr, the Quraysh turn their backs and leave their belongings. And what happened in this particular expedition, why is it called Sawiq? What is Sawiq? Sawiq is dried porridge. It is like their food that they would put on their camels, that they could eat it for a long period of time. You mix uh, barley and milk and butter and honey and then you dry it. So it's packets of food that this is what they would eat on a long journey. This is sawiq, right? And so they would basically fill their camel you know, sacks with sawiq. And that is their food if they don't get, find something else. And of course, they have water as well. So when they saw the Muslims coming and they're galloping on their horses and on their camels to get away, in order to lighten the load, they cut off the bags of sawiq. They cut off the bags of sawiq. And that is why the battle is called the Battle of Sawiq. It literally means the Battle of Porridge. It doesn't sound very interesting, but this is why it's called the Battle of Porridge, the sawiq. That they cut off all of the sawiq and... That's what caused them to basically speed up and flee away. And so the Muslims were able to capture Sawiq, a lot of porridge, uh, but they didn't have, they weren't able to harm uh, Abu Sufyan. Uh, and Abu Sufyan and his entourage returned, but at least he could now take a bath because he killed two of the Ansar, right? So his goal of basically somehow avenging what happened at Badr, even if it's just a thorn prick, he has to do something. So that was what he did, and that is the battle of uh, Sawiq. Uh, yet another incident that took place, yet another incident that took place is the Sariya of Qarada. The Sariya, and Sariya means the Prophet did not, did not participate. If you remember, I think it's almost been a year now, we differentiated between Ghazawat and Sariyat. And Ghazwa is what the Prophet participated in. So we give it a much higher status. Sariya, there are hundreds of Saraya. There are hundreds of Saraya. And Sariya is any expedition that the Prophet commanded, but he didn't participate in. And this... Sariya. Because the Prophet did not participate. He did not participate in Sawiq. Uh, the, the next one we said is Sariya of Qarada, which took place a few months before Uhud. Most likely in Rabi'ul Awwal of the third uh, year. And this was an important stepping stone to the actual battle of Uhud. So what happened was that the Quraysh 
when the annual caravan was going to take place for the third year, they had a meeting. What can we do about the caravan? Which route should it take? What are we going to do? Last year, obviously, Badr had shown them they cannot take the standard route. They have to find uh, something else. And so, Safwan ibn Umayyah, who had been placed in charge of uh, this year's caravan, unlike Abu Sufyan now, so this is now Safwan ibn Umayyah, this is the same Safwan we talked about last, last Wednesday, the same Safwan, and he's the son of Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Safwan ibn Umayyah gathered together all of the Quraysh, and he said, Muhammad and his companions have blocked our passages. If we take the sea route, close to the ocean, most of them have already given their allegiance to Muhammad وسلم, and they're upon his religion. So what do we do? Pause here. This shows us that Islam was spreading. This shows us that Islam was spreading. That these people have not been attacked, the ones on the coastal line. But Safwan ibn Umayyah is saying most of them are Muslims. And this, uh, now one of the problems is, and I've said this many times, that the biographers of the Prophet وسلم, recorded mainly battles in the Medinan phase. And a wealth of information is simply, you have to extract it. The Medina and Sira is 90% battles. And sadly, we can't do much about it because these are what our source books say. So this type of sentence just comes in the middle and we actually extract from it much information. And that is that it wasn't just battles, that Islam is spreading. And so much so that uh, Safwan ibn Umayyah is saying that most of the coastal regions are now ala dinihi. Right? So people are converting through da'wah. People are converting through preaching. People are converting through interacting with the Muslims. And uh, so then he goes on and he says, uh, so if we remain here, we will not go on any journey. We're not going to interact with the, the Syrians. And we will not get any money. And our money will dwindle down to, to nothing. And our life depends on Rihlat al Shita wa Saif. This is our lifeline. We need the two caravans. So one of the elders, and his name was Al Aswad, uh, Ibn Abdul Muttalib, not, that's not that Abdul Muttalib. One of the elders said, uh, Let us go through the Iraq passage. So, I mean, I, I don't have the map, but you all have a vague idea that Mecca is, is down here, Medina is up uh, above, and generally they would go through Syria straight above. The other alternative route was to go <laughs> eastwards and go towards what is Yambor, which is the coastal plain, westwards. right? Westwards. westwards, westwards, sorry, westwards. To go westwards towards the Yambor plain, right? So, it is west, it is west. So the other option was west, and that's what and that's what Safwan said. That Safwan said we can't go west either. What do we do? Then they said let's go the really long way, which is literally like semicircle. So then Al Aswad is saying let's go the much longer way up, basically uh, eastwards, and then up northeast, and then double back down, basically towards the route again to make their way up to Syria. And this shows us, by the way, how desperate they're getting. This shows us that Badr was a huge success in the long run even. Not just the people who were uh, captured and killed, but also in terms of uh, stopping the interference, making sure the Quraysh are feeling the pinch, if you like. So they had to find somebody who knew the route. This is not a, a common road. They had to find somebody and they hunted down a person who were able to guide them from this very strange route, which is not a route that they had ever done uh, before. And this was a route that would take them far east of Medina and then upwards northeast and then double back towards uh, Syria. And so they decided that we're going to take this route and they loaded up this caravan uh, with their goods and with silver to go to Syria. And this time the leader was Umayyah ibn Safwan. Umayya, Safwan ibn Umayyah. Safwan ibn Umayyah. Now, so this is basically Badr part two, right? The caravan, again, this is the second year now after Badr. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had willed that all of this money go directly into the hands of the Muslims. How so? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard of this even though it was supposed to be top secret, and he sent an expedition against them. How did he hear of it? It is mentioned that one of the people who was in on the secret, so there was a very secret, you know, elite group of Quraysh, one of them was drinking wine with Salit ibn Nu'man. And Salit ibn Nu'man was a Muslim who had remained in Mecca but not told anybody of his conversion. Right, And up until this point in time, wine had not been prohibited, so he's drinking with his drinking buddy. 
and the drinking buddy is in the elite circle. So he's drinking and he boasted when he was drunk. He boasted that the Quraysh have a plan that no one will be able to outsmart and we will basically ridicule the Muslims. We will have the upper hand over uh, the Prophet and he told them we're going to take this and this route to get to uh, Syria. And as soon as Salih heard this, he immediately sent the message uh, informing the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now this is basically a sitting duck. You know, you have a caravan, you have a hundred uh, camels full of you know booty and and silver and whatnot. This is a sitting duck. Even if you have fifty people guarding it, it's a caravan. It's not an army, right? And that's what they had wanted at Badr, by the way. That's what they had wanted at Badr. And so. The Prophet ﷺ, of course Allah had willed this is going to happen, right? I mean, this is just too good to be true. If 10, 15 people knew about it, one of them falls drunk and boasts about it. This is Allah's plan. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, plans it. And so the Prophet ﷺ heard about this. He sent Zayd ibn Haritha uh, to, uh, to inter inter intercede this caravan. And the entire caravan with all of the camels. And it is said over 50,000 dirhams, which is a fortune even in our times. If we were to have 50,000 and dirhams imagined back then, plus the leather, plus all of the other goods. Basically, the whole caravan, lock, stock, and barrel, came into the hands of the Prophet and the Muslims. Now, pause here. Allah Azza wa had promised the Muslims at Badr that I'll give you one of the two. In fact, Allah gave them both. Think about it. Are you guys following? Back at Badr, Allah had said, Don't worry, you will have one of the two. But Allah is al karim And when the Muslims got what they didn't want, Allah gave them what they wanted. This was the Qadr of Allah, right? So when they didn't get the, the actual first caravan, khalas, the second one with zero casualties, by the way. Zero casualties. They got lock, stock and barrel, the entire uh, caravan. And this made the Quraysh so desperate that it led up to because now khalas, they have no way, right? Imagine now, nothing is left. And so there's a level of desperation now that they have to do something. And this is what led to the battle of uh, Uhud. And the battle of Uhud we will discuss when we come back. There is one major incident left which I was dreading to do, but it needs to be done. It is one of the most controversial. It is one of the, this is the uh, Sariya of Qarada. Qarada with the Dal, Qarada. Uh, and it's the, there was no battle per se. Again, zero casualties, right? You have a hundred, uh, you know, Muslims coming, and the caravan is protected by, you know, just a, a light protection because they really did not think that the process and would ever figure this out. It's such a desperate move to go from this unknown passage. You have to find a guide who's going to figure this out. But. Allah Azza wa Jal wanted to expose them. Nonetheless, let us now get to this controversial issue. What is this controversial issue? It is the issue of Ka'ab ibn al-Ashraf. Ka'ab ibn al-Ashraf. And the killing of Ka'ab ibn al-Ashraf. Right? And this is no doubt one of the most uh, sensitive issues of the seerah. And uh, it deserves some special attention. So, who is Ka'ab and what's so sensitive about this issue? Ka'ab ibn al-Ashraf. He was the son of an Arab father and a Jewish mother. So he has a unique merging. His father was a pure Arab, a pagan. His father was an Arab. And his mother was of the Jews of the Banu Nadir. His father was from the tribe of the, of the Banu Nabhan, which is far away from Medina. But he had committed murder, his father, not him. So he had to flee his own people or else to get uh, safe. He had to flee his own people. And so he fled and he was adopted by the Banu Nadir of, of Yathrib. We're talking about way before Islam. 50, 40 years before Islam. He's adopted by the Banu Nadir. Right? And when they adopted him, then they allowed him to marry one of their women. Okay? So he marries one of them. And then from this marriage, Ka'ab ibn al-Ashraf is born. And so Ka'ab is basically a full Arab and a full Jew because of course in Judaism the, 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 the religion is from the mother, right? Uh, and so he has lineage, he has basically the nasab of the Arabs and he also has the religion and the tarbiyah and the, uh, and the, and the, 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 the nobility 
that the Banu Nadir has. And he was of the Ashraf of the Banu Nadir, which means he was of the leaders of the Banu Nadir. And he was known for many things. Number one, his richness. He was a rich man. He had his own fortress. He lived in his own fortress. Number two, he was known for his uh, handsomeness. He was one of the most handsome people of Yathrib. He was one of the most handsome people of Yathrib. And generally when you have two races mixing together, you get the best of both. This is the Sunnah of Allah. So uh, he was known for his handsomeness. And number three, he was known for his shi'r, his poetry. He was a poet. He was a uh, poet. And his animosity to Islam was demonstrated from very early on. Of the earliest was right when the Prophet emigrated and the Qibla was changed. This is way early on, like the second month, third month after the Hijrah, right? When the Qibla is changed. That when the Qibla was changed, it was Kaab who said, مَا وَاللَّهُمْ عَنْ قِبْلَتِهِمْ Why would they change their Qibla that they used to have? And Allah says in the Quran, سَيَقُولُ السُّفَهَاءُ مِنَ النَّاسِ And he quotes Kaab. This is Kaab. The second Jews, look it up, the first ayah of the second Jews, this is Kaab. سَيَقُولُ السُّفَهَاءُ مِنَ النَّاسِ مَا وَاللَّهُمْ عَنْ قِبْلَتِهِمْ وَلَدْكَانُوا عَلَيْهَا This is Kaab. Right? So he's mocking now. They were praying this way, now they're going to pray this way. What type of religion is this? So very early on we see his uh, mockingness. Uh, when the commandment for zakah was revealed, also very early on in the Meccan stage, when the commandment of zakah was revealed, Ka'ab went to his friends who had converted from the Ansar now, so his friends uh, from uh, pre-Islam who had converted, and he said, do not give any of your money. Because I am worried that you will become poor if you keep on giving your money away like this. And don't be hasty in getting rid of this wealth because you don't know what's going to happen to this man. Meaning, maybe the situation will change, will go back to the way it used to be. And at this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in Surah An-Nisa, it is mentioned, الَّذِينَ يَبْخَلُونَ وَيَأْمُرُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْبُخُلِ Those people who are stingy and they command others to be stingy. وَيَكْتُمُونَ مَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ And they hide what Allah Azza wa Jal has given of His blessings. So this is a description of Ka'ab. That he was stingy in being charitable. He was very rich by the way, but he was not charitable. And he was commanding others to be stingy as well. And many other small things like this are mentioned. A number of verses in the Quran that talk about certain things that are said. It is Ka'ab and we don't have time to go every one of them. Uh, at the Battle of Badr, when the two criers came back, uh, Zayd ibn Haritha uh, and the other crier, when they came back from Badr announcing, so-and-so has died, so-and-so has died. When Kaab heard the news, he said, mockingly, sarcastically, if Muhammad وسلم, has really killed all of these people, then it is better to be inside the earth than outside of it. It's better to be dead than alive. If truly these men are dead, oh, and, and he added, and these are from the noblest of the Arabs. If he has really killed all of these people, then we might as well be dead. It is better to be dead than alive. And uh, dare I say, he pronounced the verdict against himself. Okay, if that's what you want, you will get it. Right? So he said, it's better to be dead than alive, and indeed that is what happened in a while. Uh, when the victory of Badr was fully manifested in front of Kaab, he undertook a secret expedition to Abu Sufyan with a small group of the Banu Nadir. Now the Banu Nadir will be the second tribe that we're going to deal with, right? So keep these points in mind, what is happening now. Firstly, they already helped Abu Sufyan, right? Now another thing is going to happen. That the uh, Ka'b al Ashraf goes with a small entourage to Abu Sufyan in Mecca and he forms an alliance with him against the Prophet sallallahu now, what are the details of this alliance? We have no idea. None of the books of Sirah mentioned because again, this was something between the two of them and then he was killed shortly afterwards. What is known is he formed an alliance. What could this alliance be other than a surprise attack? Other than a tactic, what is to be done, right? Other than details, you come, I'll help you here. This is common sense, but what are the details? We do not know. So he formed an alliance with Abu Sufyan and uh, he then, uh, and uh, Abu Sufyan, one of the last things that Abu Sufyan asked him, he said, Unashiduk Allah, I ask you, swearing by Allah, Abu Sufyan is asking Kaab, which of the two religions is closer and more beloved to Allah? Our religion or the religion of Muhammad Now he's asking a monotheist 
Ka'ab is a monotheist, he's a Yehudi. Which of the two religions is better, paganism or the monotheism of Islam? Right? And so, Ka'ab is a Yehudi. Was he asking real questions and he wants to know or just... So, he is asking Ka'ab, in your opinion, which of these two religions is more beloved to Allah? To right? To remember, remember the pagans felt an inferiority complex towards the Yehud. Remember. They felt an inferiority complex towards the Yehud because the Yehud were Thaqafa, people of civilization. Yaqra'oon, they would read and write. They have tariqh, they have the Torah. So they felt uh, inferior to them. And this is what many incidents show this, right? So he is saying now that who, which of these two religions is more beloved to, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, Ka'ab said that Antum ahda minhum sabila. Antum ahda minhum sabila. You are more rightly guided than them. You are more rightly guided than them. And Allah references this conversation in the Quran. In Surah An-Nisa verse 50. That, Alam tara ila ladhina yaz'umuna. Alam tara ila ladhina utu nasiba min al-kitab. Don't you see those who have been given a share of the book? Right? Wa yu'minuna bil jibti wa taghut. And they believe in jibt and taghut. Jibt and taghut, there's a lot of controversy what exactly it means. But it basically means things that are evil. Uh, and, وَيَقُولُونَ لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا And they say to those who have done kufr, هَأُولَاءِ أَهْدَى مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا سَبِيلًا He's quoting Ka'ab again. Allah is quoting this private conversation. That they are more rightly guided than the believers. هَأُولَاءِ أَهْدَى مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا سَبِيلًا And this is exactly what Ka'ab said in that private conversation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes him again. This is Surah An-Nisa verse 50. So he then returns to Medina after having formed this secret alliance with uh, Abu Sufyan, but Allah has told the Prophet of this secret alliance. Then he does the last straw. When he returns to Medina, he has the last straw, and that is, he is a poet, and and uh, I did not mention that he has already written a lot of poetry against the Prophet against the Muslims. Now he starts writing, uh, how should we say this, uh, sensual poetry about Muslim ladies i.e. basically erotic poetry to make fun of the Muslim ladies and to entice uh, men to think about them basically right so it's very vivid poetry you get the point here that as a satire as a as a mockery he starts describing and talking about specific by name by the way specific ladies Muslim ladies right and now this is obviously really like a little bit too crude it's a little bit too crude he's really crossing the line in all in all, in all, especially at that time, but even now amongst me. But yani, this is a little bit too much, right? Uh, and so, this is basically the final straw. Now I have to add one more point here. So, according to Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, Al-Waqidi, Ka'ab was assassinated between Badr and Uhud, which is why we're doing it now. But there is another opinion. And that is the opinion of great scholars as well, Muqatil ibn Sulaiman and Al-Baghawi, and uh, others, as salihi as well, who, is, who has a very, one of the largest books of seerah ever written is uh, Subul al-Huda wa rashad uh, by as salihi which is literally, literally like 12 volumes. It's one of the largest books ever written. Uh, and uh, he's a very famous scholar of seerah, died around, I want to say 900 something. So, you know, medieval, not ancient and not medieval. So he, according to salihi as well, Ka'ab was executed, Ka'ab was, was killed, basically, after Uhud and not after Badr. After Uhud and before Khandaq, but right after Uhud. And all of them add one more reason, which Al-Waqidi and Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham cannot add because it didn't take place in their time. And that is the blatant assassination attempt against the Prophet ﷺ, which the Banu Nadir did. Now we're jumping the story here, but we have to just mention, you all are familiar with the, the vague story of the process of having been invited to a poisoned meal, right? Now, this occurred after Uhud. So we're not talking about it now. But according to al salihi and uh, Muqatil ibn Sulaiman and uh, Al-Baghawi and others, the guy behind the plot was Ka'ab. That it was his idea to poison the food and he was killed the, the night of 
literally 12 hours before Banu Nadir battle, the battle of Banu Nadir. Like they got rid of him and then the next morning, literally, maybe even 5-6 hours because he was killed in the middle of the night. They, they killed Kaab in the middle of the night. And then the next morning, according to those authorities, they marched upon Banu Nadir. So if we follow that version of events, then it's even more clear what's going on. However, we'll stick with Ibn Ishaq because he's Ibn Ishaq. So, you know, Allahu Alam, and frankly, this is one of those issues of Sirah, how are we going to resolve it now? When did he die? If it's before the battle of Uhud, then the issue of, uh, the, issue of the poison doesn't take place. However, as salihi also says that, the, and this is perhaps j uh, joining between the two stories, that the idea of poisoning the food came from him. So it wasn't able to be executed at the time, they had to wait until after Uhud, but it was his idea that why don't you invite him to ta'am masmum? You put poison in it, right? So we'll have a big feast and he will eat the food and then he will die. And then eventually they did that after his death. In any, if that is the case, and obviously we can add even one more reason. But even if we don't uh, follow uh, Baghawi's uh, chr chronology, then still we have enough reasons as it is. In any case, when all of this took place, uh, the Prophet ﷺ stood up and he said, uh, Who will take care of Ka'b ibn Ashraf? Malli bi Ka'b. Who will take care of Ka'b ibn Ashraf? And so, uh, uh, because he has harmed or irritated Allah and His Messenger. فَقَدْ آذَى اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ yeah, The, the آذَى, آذَى here means to, to, not to harm because Allah is never harmed, but He has irritated. He has, you know, uh, uh, basically gone beyond the bounds here. And so, Muhammad ibn Maslama stood up and he said, I will do it, O Messenger of Allah. Muhammad ibn Maslama was from the Aus. And Ka'ab had, before, uh, before in the days of Jahiliyyah, remember the Aus and the Banu Nadir were one. Right? And of course, this is of his wisdom that he didn't want a Khazraji to do it, or else this would bring up black, bad blood. You understand the point here that the Khazraj and the Banu Nadir already have problems from pre Islam, whereas the Aus and the Banu Nadir don't have any problems. So Muhammad ibn Maslam, being one of the senior of the Aus, said, "I will do it." And then, if he does it, there can be no problems between the Aus and the Khazraj. I mean, sorry, the Aus and the Banu Nadir, because they were one in the days of uh, Jahiliyyah. Remember, we talked about this, right? The the Yehudi tribes had allied, and and so the the alliances played a big role here. So somebody that had already allied with Kaab in the days of Jahiliyyah, he's the one who volunteered in order to save the potential of the Jahili civil war being resurrected. You see the point, right? So Muhammad Maslama uh, volunteered to do it. According to Ibn, Ibn Hisham, for three days after this, Muhammad Ibn Maslama stopped eating and drinking. Until finally somebody came to the process to tell him that Muhammad Ibn Maslama is not eating and drinking. So he visited him, he said, what is the matter? So he said, O Messenger of Allah, I promised you something, and then I realized I might not be able to fulfill that promise, and so in his anxiety, basically he's so anxious, can you imagine, like he got so worried that I promised you I do it and then I realized what if I can't? How am I going to then basically make up for this, right? Remember he's a rich man, he has his own fortress, he's well guarded, he has an entourage, how am I going to do this? And so the Prophet ﷺ said, all you need to do is try. I'm not asking you to, you know, success is with Allah you have to try, that's all. Uh, and so this calmed him down, obviously, because he was thinking, what if I'm not able to do it? I'm in big trouble then. Uh, and so uh, he said, in that case, O Messenger of Allah, allow me to say something. Meaning, you have to allow me to say things that I don't mean. Allow me to say something. And so the Prophet said, say as you like. Say as you like. So Muhammad ibn Maslama then called upon Ka'b in his, let's say in his office hours, i.e. at a time when is clearly nothing can be done. He called upon Ka'b, there were other people sitting there. He said to Ka'b, look I have something very private I need to talk to you with. So they went to a corner and uh, he said, so now uh, Muhammad al-Maslama is saying to Ka'b, Muhammad is saying to Ka'b that this man, meaning the Prophet ﷺ, has come and caused us irritation for the last years, few years. And the Arabs are now all against us. And on top of that, he's asking for our money, charity. Because the Arabs didn't have a concept of charity. right? So he's asking for our money. And he has put us through so much trouble and hardship. With this war and the battle of Badr and this and that. He's put us through so much hardship. When Kaab heard this, he felt so happy. Because here he was thinking Muhammad is a convert. 
right? He was thinking that Muhammad Muslim is on their side, and now he's coming to him and showing that no, in reality, he's just on the same wavelength as Haskab. So he got really happy at this. And he goes, Wallahi, this is just the beginning. He is going to put you through much more hardship. Just you wait and you see. He's going to put you through much more hardship. And so they continued along this vein. So you understand why did Muhammad ibn Muslim have to give a special dispensation that I'm not, you know, I'm not able to say things that, you know, I need to say things that otherwise I would not be wanting to say. Until finally he said that, uh, well, now we are his followers and we cannot forsake him until the situation turns a little bit, i.e. let something happen and then we can change and show our true colors. Until that time, I need you to loan me to pay him that money, i.e. zakat. Give me some loan and I will, uh, and I will uh, give it to the process and then pay you back. Now, uh, Muhammad ibn Maslama, one of the ways he got rich was by, uh, by giving money. Right, so he's a uh, money lender, if you like. And of course, when you lend money, then you will uh, get uh, more back from it. So this is one of the ways that he got so rich. So he had a system or a routine. And everybody knows that that's why he's here now. That's why Muhammad Maslama is in Kaab's office, basically, asking for a loan. And so the procedure back then, still is to this day, what's your mortgage? Give me a mortgage. So he said, I don't have anything to give. I mean, that's why I'm here. I'm here for the, the, the money. I don't have anything to give. So he said, okay, leave your, uh, leave your wife in my house. Leave your wife in my house. So uh, he said, by Allah, you are the most handsome of men. So he's praising, buttering him up, right? And he was handsome. You are the most handsome of men. And you expect me to trust a woman in your presence. So he puts it on him that you're so charming and alluring like Yusuf that the women are going to rush to you. You expect me to trust a woman in your presence? I can't do that. So he's flattered. He takes the, you know, the bait and then he goes, okay, then leave your sons with me. Khalas, if you're worried about your wife, leave your sons with me. And you know, until you can pay it off in a few days and you can take your sons back. So he said, my sons... So they will grow up for the rest of their lives and their friends are teasing them that you were the mortgage for some barley, some grain. So you know, the, you, know you were the, the mortgage that your father had to give. Right? No, I can't have this as a permanent dishonor. I can't give you my sons. So he said, what then? You need to give me some, some mortgage. So he said, what if I bring you weapons? My weapons. You see where he's heading with this. Right. What if I bring you my weapons, swords and spears and what? What if I bring that to you? And you know we need these weapons now because of all of these wars going on. So I'm desperate to get them back. So this is a very urgent mortgage that you will possess. So he said, great idea. Okay, bring your weapons. And of course you understand the tactic here. That he'll show up armed to the hilt and there's no suspicion. Right? This is, you have to say, there's a little bit of genius here. Right? Uh, now, uh, a <clears throat> little bit of gray area, what exactly happened, but it seems that two or three of the other Sahaba, along with Muhammad ibn Maslama, had basically also gotten mortgages from, uh, from Ka'ab along the similar lines. Right, that once the idea of weapons came up, so then two or three others, Silkan ibn Salama, Abu Na'ila are mentioned here, that they came and they basically said, look, you gave him money for, the, for weapons, let's do the same. We also need the money and uh, we'll give you our weapons as well. And so he agreed to all of this because obviously he's going to get back much more as you understand how money exchanging works. Uh, and therefore, he, uh, Abu Na'ila, set a particular time, he goes, look, we have to do this in secret because we don't want anybody to see us. So let's come at such and such a time at night, we will come and we will uh, basically give all of this to you, you can give us the money and we'll be on our way. So according to Al-Waqidi, this took place on the 14th of Rabi'ul Awwal in the third year of the Hijrah. And that's why, uh, because he has a date, it seems he knows more than what Al-Baghawi knows. So to be fair, it seems the stronger position is that of Al-Waqidi and Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham. And in any case, they are the more authoritative in the seerah than the others whom we mentioned. And so, to be academically fair, it seems closer to the truth that Ka'ab was killed between Badan and Uhud. Okay, this seems to be more authentic because the bigger authorities are mentioning this. Nonetheless, you should be aware that there is another interpretation. And if that is true, then it's even easier. But even if it's not true, we have enough you know, to, to justify this uh, for that time. Uh, so, 
they so they agreed to come on the 14th of Rabi'ul Awal and it was a full moon it was a full moon the the books of Sirah mentioned that there was no clouds in the sky it was a full moon and the prophet sallam walked with them to Baqi' al gharqat and at the very end he said may Allah help you in your mission so he blessed them basically may Allah help you in your mission and they then went to his castle which was a fortress which was on the outskirts of the city and they called out to him from below to come to come on outside and uh, it is said that he had just married another wife uh, so he is now a newlywed with another uh, lady and he was uh, lying with her when he heard the voice so he stood up to go and she held on to him and she said, where are you going at this time? So he said, oh, this is uh, Abu Na'ila and Abu Muhammad al-Maslama. They have come to give me some of their goods. So she held on and she said, this is not right. Why are they coming at this time? And then she said, and we're going to come back to this phrase, you are a man at war and I'm worried for you. We're going to come back to this phrase. You are a man at war and I'm worried for you. What you are doing at this time. So he said, no, uh, Abu Na'ila is my foster brother. So this shows us that one of the people that had basically joined Muhammad ibn Maslama was the foster brother, which means the same lady suckled him and Abu Na'ila. Right? Abu Na'ila is my foster brother. And Muhammad ibn Maslama, I know him from pre-Islam basically. He was, that's why Muhammad ibn Maslama volunteered. I know him from pre-Islam. I trust them basically. So he basically dragged himself off of her. And he went down and uh, Muhammad al had already told them what he was going to do. And that is that uh, he will, through some ruse or tactic, hold on to his head and have him in, in an arm grip and then the others will do the deed. Right Now, they knew that he was going to be armed because he was always heavily armed. He was a strong man. He had one of the most expensive armors because that's what they were known for, to build armors, to buy armor. So that he has wearing his personal uh, armor, armory as well. So they come down and it is a beautiful night. The moon is shining, uh, full moon. And they began uh, talking and just, you know, uh, gossiping and whatnot, as was the way in, in the days of Jahiliyyah. And then Abu Na'ila said, I smell the nicest perfume coming from you. I smell the sweetest and where is this from? So he answered, yes, I have with me a young lady who is the most scented of all of the women of Arabia. Now the Arabs prize their scents, they love their, their musk and she's with me in bed basically. This is where that smell is coming from. So he said, allow me to smell it, it smells so good, allow me to smell it. So he came closer, he said, smell it, right? So he, then he said, oh, it's coming from your hair, please let me smell it. So. He lowered his hair to so he can smell it. And so he held on to him. And then the others basically uh, did the deed. But it wasn't easy. Because of his armor that he was wearing, it wasn't easy. And it is said that one of them, Al-Harith ibn Aus, uh, he was severely wounded by uh, the others who were attacking. He was severely wounded. Uh, and he was bleeding badly. had to limp back to uh, Medina. And so they returned back to Medina. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ met them. And he... Uh, put some of his saliva on Al-Harith, his wounds, and it healed instantaneously. And this was basically the end of Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf. Now, it is very obvious why this incident is problematic in light of modern times. It's very obvious why this is a very sensitive issue. And that is because the charge is given that this is a blatant uh, assassination attempt that is justified by uh, the Prophet sallallahu And it is an authentic incident. It is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, it is mentioned in Ibn Hisan. I mean, there is no way to deny this, even though some Muslims, you know, they have this methodology, anything that's embarrassing, try to get rid of it. Uh, and you know, this is not my philosophy. Uh, so some of them, they try to get rid of it, but it is obviously an authentic, uh, an authentic incident. Sahih al-Bukhari has a whole chapter, the chapter of the killing of Ka'b ibn Ashraf. And you have a number of of narration which are very explicit. Sahih Muslim, it is in Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham. I mean, there is no book of seerah except that it mentions it, right? If you're going to deny this, then wallah, you've denied everything that we have of the seerah. Clearly, it took place. Now, a number of reasons are given why this assassination took place. The most obvious reason is this treaty with Abu Sufyan. This is the most obvious, number one on the list, that he goes all the way to Mecca, and he enacts some top secret treaty that we don't know the details about. But it is very clear, I mean, what else can it be other than a type of battle that will take place with the Banu Nadir and the Quraysh helping one another against the Muslims. This is understood, right? So a time, a place, weapons, whatnot, all of this has been agreed and discussed. So it's very clear that this is a threat to the community. Um, 
Another issue that is mentioned is the uh, verses or there's the poetry against the, the women, the Muslim ladies. Another reason that is mentioned is uh, if you want to follow al baghawis chronology, then of course we have the number one reason would be the direct attempt at assassinating the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And frankly, I mean, here is one of those issues that, of course, the reasons are very solid, by the way. So these reasons are very solid. I mean, uh, apart from Baghawi's one, which is an issue of chronology, the Abu Sufyan Treaty is very clear that this is a man who needs to be taken care of for his political danger to Islam and to the Muslims. The problem comes not that he wasn't a criminal, but in the manner of getting rid of him, right? And that is basically an execution or an assassination. Not that he wasn't guilty, but that in our time, in our place, technically, we would put him on trial and then pronounce a verdict and then maybe execute. Okay, if that's the thing, right? So this is really the main, uh, if you like, charge that is laid and that is the charge of assassination. Now, frankly, here is one of those points where I think one of our problems is we are judging the political situation in the time of the Prophet ﷺ as if it is in our time. And we're judging him with our own laws and customs and trying to retroactively look at the seerah in light of modern laws. Frankly, those were different societies. Those were different times. And the people who lived in those societies, they understood the dynamics of that society. And that is why we go back to that interesting phrase of his wife. When she told him that you are a man at war, even though he himself who did not participate in a battle up until that point against the Muslims, right? But she, and she's a woman, understood that what my husband is doing, you're declaring war, and you are not safe. And she understood this, because the customs of the time, the political landscape at that time, was very different than our landscape. And the laws at that time were very different. And therefore, in my humble opinion, I don't feel the need to try to justify in light of our laws. That's something that they did and they understood it and it was understood for that point in time. The fact that in our time it might not be done, okay, so be it. If we had a theoretical modern Islamic state and the laws were different, it is not wajib to follow those types of laws in our times. It's not at all wajib. We can have our own system of laws. And if we have a different system than those systems, there's no problem in that at all. But the main point here, at that time, the Prophet ﷺ is basically the government of Islam. And his decree is political and religious and legal all in one. And therefore, he is the judge and he is the ruler. And therefore, it is legal for him to do this in this manner. He didn't do this in Mecca when he doesn't have any authority, political authority. He didn't do it in Mecca. Hold on, we're getting there. He didn't do it in Mecca when he didn't have any political authority. He didn't do it when he didn't have sulta, we call it, which is executive power. Rather, he did it when he himself now has actual political power. And therefore, Frankly, I don't see the need to quote-unquote defend this action. This is what it is. And we don't need to try to sugarcoat it. It is what it is. He did it, and in that time and place, completely justified. Should, do we have to recreate that uh, type of, uh, if you like, tactic in our time? It is up to the Islamic government. Theoretically, if they want to decide this, there is no Islamic government. If, the, if there is one, it is up to them to decide what laws to run. And what is clear, and this is the main point here, is that the reason he has been killed is not because he rejected Islam. You can be a kafir. It's not even because he ridiculed the Prophet ﷺ personally. It is because of his political actions. And then frankly, there is that line of, of you know, we, ha we do have, and it is very true, and it is a part of our Islamic culture, to have an extra respect and, in Arabic, is ghira, which is, uh, there is no English term. I've thought about this a lot. There is no English term for ghira. No, no, ghira is a very specific term. It's a, it's a, it's a positive jealousy or whatnot or an honor that you have uh, for those who are defenseless and you. So, uh, basically, the the issue of Ka'ab ibn al Ashraf, in my humble opinion, there's no need to become apologetic. It's very clear that what the Prophet did was 
completely understood, expected, and, and legal for his time and place. And as for our time and place, it's something that we can, uh, the Islamic State can decide what to do. And then we also have to add here, very frankly, in light of recent developments where our own country and government has now opened this door of targeted assassinations and of killing its own citizens, knowing it's killing them, right? And of sending drones against even 16-year-old kids now. We have to be very frank here. Nobody who agrees with this tactic can find any problem with the story of Cap. Let's just silence that immediately. You cannot, you cannot have your cake and eat it as well, right? You cannot be a kettle calling the, 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 the pot to, you know, it's just not going to happen. You cannot agree to this tactic, which is, by the way, much worse for many reasons which we want to get into now, but it is much worse, right, to send a drone bomb onto a 16-year-old kid and then not one squeak is raised. And not just this, but everybody that they, that they have killed more than their own citizens. This is now open policy, right? And it is now constitutional and legal. As of yet, it has not been challenged in any court, and no court has been able to take it. So, this is now, what is happening is 10 or 100 times worse than what happened back then. And anybody who then agrees with this cannot have any problem with that. Nonetheless, I don't feel the need to, to try to justify or defend. I think it is what it is, that the Prophet ﷺ saw the threat that Ka'ab was. And in fact, it showed us as well, and Ibn Ishaq mentions this, that with the killing of Ka'ab, the other Yehud, they were inflicted with a fear. They understood what's going on, the dynamics, and many of them did not leave their fortresses for days after that. Right? And there is a message being sent. And frankly, if you look at the process of relationship with the Yehud, it does get stricter over time, and this is what you expect. That if th this is not going to work, then how about this? If this is not going to work, then how about that? Right? It's getting stricter because they themselves are getting more blatant. Right? You have the Banu Qaynuqa threatening him directly to his face. You didn't fight men. Remember this last week. You didn't fight men. You fought a bunch of cowards. If you had fought real men, you would have seen what would have happened. Can you believe you're telling this to your leader? Right? And then you have over here the Banu Nadir. Already now helping Banu, uh, Abu Sufyan out, by the way. Right? Now, I tried my best to find out. Did they help Abu Sufyan in this expedition of Qarqaratul Qadr or not? Did Kaab in particular help? Because it says the Banu Nadir helped Abu Sufyan, right? I tried my best to look every single book up uh, today and nothing is mentioned who from the Banu Nadir helped. But if we were to add the possibility that Kaab was one of the main people who helped Abu Sufyan and it would make sense that a few weeks later he then travels to Abu Sufyan, right? Now this is my theory. Take it or leave it and we'll never know fully. But it makes sense to me to add one and one to get two. Which is a few weeks after Abu Sufyan attacks Medina, Ka'ab goes all the way to Abu Sufyan. So I have a theory, and it's just a theory, we're never going to know. Maybe it was Ka'ab himself who helped Abu Sufyan in that attack on Medina. right? And if this is the case, then even more, because what does the book of Sirah say? The Banu Nadir helped him. And Ka'ab is of the Ashraf of Banu Nadir. So frankly, there's just too much uh, of a gray area, if you like. Uh, to, to, you know, to put all of this together. Allah knows best, but I think it, it is a good, if you like, guess to make that it was Ka'ab and a group of Ka'ab that helped and the group of Ka'ab that helped Abu Sufyan. In any case, to summarize, and then inshallah we open the floor for Q&A because I don't want to start Uhud or else we will, it's not going to be appropriate to start Uhud right now. To summarize, I think that the incident of Ka'b ibn Ashraf needs to be told like it is, and that is that it is a political incident that the Prophet ﷺ approved. It was in accordance with the norms, with the understandings, with the political society and laws of his time. And it was done not because Ka'b was a poet, even though yes, that added to it, but it was because Ka'b was a genuine political threat, and that he had gone above and beyond merely rejecting Islam. And we notice here, in, or in the seerah, that a kafir is never harmed or killed just because he's a kafir. Rather, there is a line, and that line is obvious. You start describing women, then in Muslim women, you start telling men to visit them. That's where the, you know, the poetry is, is there, you can read it. Like, literally, it's like he's, I mean, I don't want to mention this, in the, but you get the point here, you know? Like he's literally saying things. Uh, he, there's a line, you just don't cross it. You know, and for him to go to this level, he knows what he's getting involved with, right? 
to have an alliance with Abu Sufyan. He knows what he's getting involved with. Therefore, honestly, he knows the risks. His wife understood the risks. And she's a woman. She's not even involved. She understands the risks, right? That my husband's doing these things. So, here it is. That is the story of Kaab ibn Ashraf. And we have no qualms in saying this is exactly what happened. I don't see the point sugarcoating it. It is what it is. And it is something that, um, frankly, I don't see any problem with as the Prophet ﷺ having done. And with this, inshaAllah ta'ala, we will uh, take a few questions and then break for <coughs> Salat Al-Isha. Now you're raising this issue between me and him. <laughs> <laughs> of the ijtihad of the Prophet ﷺ. Whatever the Prophet ﷺ did, whether it was directly commanded or not, Allah Azza wa Jal indirectly approved. So in the end, it is all from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Whether it is direct or indirect, it's semantics. In the end, it is from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Kaab was from Banu Nadir. He violated the deal so that's the point he violated the treaty the constitution so again the problem comes not that he should be punished but how he was punished the the there's no judge trial jury this is the point there's no jail he didn't by the way there was no jail in Medina the concept of jails was much later on in Islam so the point that that Non-Muslim. There's a whole article. I mean, you can understand this is story. I mean, it's not for Allah, but the an the anti-Islamic websites. This is probably the top two, three stories. This is one of those that they love to harp on, right? And that is the assassination of the Prophet. Kill a person like uh, Saddam Hussein. You destroy the whole country to kill a person. This is our job to show the double standards. So, so the, the, the person to kill the whole country. This is our job to show the double standards, right? This is our job. That's a part of what we do. That they have no right to criticize in light of their own history. And that's what I said as well, especially in light of recent history, which is what is happening is even more blatant targeted assassinations. Okay, yes? In the story with Banu Qaynuqa, where the Prophet stated very clearly that the Sahifa has been broken. Yes. Why didn't that happen this time? Is there any wisdom in not stating? It's going to happen right after. So just give it a few months. Right? It's building up. It's going to happen with the Banu Nadir. Right? So things are happening that shows the character of Banu Nadir. And then the time will come when it is right to basically uh, take action against them. Right? But right now, action is taken against the main instigator within the Banu Nadir. Against the individual, not the tribe. But taking action against him is an indirect message to the whole tribe. Right. Sisters, any question? Yes. So what was the reaction of the Banu Nadir? So the books of Sira mentioned that not just the Banu Nadir, the other tribes, they all uh, basically complained about this. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ did not basically take their complaints, give you know, do anything about them, uh, those complaints, because he had in fact ordered it himself. And the message was given, Ibn Ishaq says that uh, not a single tribe of, of, of them basically felt safe afterwards. That they felt that the threat is, um, you know, coming around them. And this is one of the direct, basically, reasons, you know, for, for doing this. And that is to send the message, you can't get away with this. You cannot get away with blatant treason. I mean, that's no country allows this, you know. So yes, they did complain, and their complaints were not basically uh, responded to because that's justified. Okay, yes. Which one are you talking about? The caravan. The caravan. The caravan? No, they fled. The Quraysh fled. There was no, there were no prisoners of war, and there were no casualties. No blood was shed, and this is the the whole beauty that Allah gifted them this entire ghanima without a drop of blood, and this is, as I said, it's an amazing. Just think about it, Wallahi, This is the generosity of Allah I mean, just you know, amazing, right? They get all of this, and then on top of that, they get that as well, without even, you know, they didn't realize it even at the time. And Allah Azza wa gave it to them without a drop of blood being shed. So literally, just this 
wealth of the Quraysh just comes in. And by, uh, remember this point because put yourself, you know, basically from their perspective. How desperate are you going to be now? You can't go the main route. You can't go the alternative route. The only other route, khalas, that's also taken out, right? You are cutting off the oxygen. And they're desperate now. And this is what was exactly the intent of the Prophet Right? Yes? One, one more question. So when, uh, when Kaab was killed, he had bodyguards. Didn't he didn't take... That's why they came at night. So he had no bodyguards? No, that, that, there was nobody. Came nobody came. Because that's the point. They came late at night because... They themselves don't want the people to know that they're getting uh, money and putting the, the stuff there. And so they, put, they set the, 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 the time with him, the, more, the appointment time. They said, we'll come at night, uh, you know, on the 14th basically. And so it was completely empty. It was desolate. He came alone. His wife was begging him to come. He came alone. So this was the whole point of having convinced him that they genuinely want to give him this to get more money and whatnot. So he fell for it basically. Yes. Go ahead, yes. Question of uh, trial before execution. This is the third year of Hijra. And it means the 8th, 9th, 10th. The political authority of Sassan is not established yet. Uh, if you look at any other historical event, General George Washington fighting for independence. Because he was not in fact in the new war situation. So authority is not settled, so could we not use that as a reason? But the reason we don't have everything established in Hijra. This is a good point, and that is that um, uh, what uh, Dr. Zaman is saying is that at this point in time, there is no established law and order. Still, there's a lot of threats internally and externally. And if you look at any revolution, even the American Revolution, George Washington, when he was fighting the British and others, you know, every, every, every revolution that takes place, it's not a clean thing. You know, any type of look around what's happening these days, you know, in, in, in our own Arab Springs, what's happening, you know, it's a chaos and confusion. Yes, this can also be said. Uh, this can also be said that this is, this is a good point, that there is no uh, system up and running yet, and that the, the system is still being established. Yes, this is a good point. Allah knows best. Final question before.